I'm really delighted to, to uh, welcome Russ Sabrilia here to talk about Herman Melville and Moby Dick and Hegel and Lacan. So maybe not in that order, but uh, I know that order of, of I don't, that's not a ranking order, but uh, it will be an order that will approach things. So I'd like for Russ to start out maybe talking about the position that Moby Dick has in Melville's whole career, because I find this kind of interesting, the role that it plays and maybe the role that it has in American literature and then what you found philosophically interesting about it. So this is a long probably will require a long answer, but hopefully you can you can nail it down. Well, I, you know, I can answer that, but I thought I, I'm going back through my emails here. I, th- th- hey, Russ, let's talk about the Josh Allen deal soon. What do you think <laughs> about it? It's too bad Joe Burrow will never be as good as him. Love Todd. Like, OK, so fine. We could talk about Melville. But yeah, I, thought no, this we, was... I guess I guess that would be. But that would be a different audience. I think. <laughs> uh, no. OK, seriously. Um, so. I mean, Moby Dick is is the center. It's the centerpiece of Melville's career, um, re- retrospectively or you know retroactively. Right. Um, I think that there did was he a think time it was? Did he, when he wrote it. Did he think it was? I think that he, he. I think that he thought it was, but I think that he also knew. Uh, and you can tell this from uh, letters that he was writing to Hawthorne at the time. So maybe just I'll briefly explain that uh, for a bit. So. There's this very brief couple year period where um, Melville is living in uh, the Berkshires and he meets Hawthorne um, and Hawthorne has this um, what huge year influence. What on, year that? Yeah. Uh, I think it's late. I think it's 48 or 49. It might be 50. It's 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 right. So it's like with it's very it's right before. by then. Melville. Yes. Yeah, right. Okay. Omu is published in in 46, his first his first book. Okay. And, you know, Melville's first. Um, so he published five books before Moby Dick, um, five novels. And the first two, Typey and Omu, are basically just sort of like adventure narratives and uh, uh, based largely on personal experience. And then because Melville's life itself was fascinating. But then his third book, Marty, is this. Uh, metaphysical, um, even longer than 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 Moby Dick, this long sort of metaphysical yarn, and people who already were you know bought Melville's books. There was also some controversy about them because it was sort of like um, you know a critique of Christian missionaries and everything in, in Typey at least. So it generated a lot of buzz, and then people got Marty, and they were like, "What the hell is this? Right. It didn't sell." So he went back and wrote two. I don't want to like dismiss them as, as pot boilers, but he wrote two other novels in between um, uh, Marty and Moby Dick, uh, Redburn and White Jacket. And then he writes Moby Dick. And I think as a result of his, you know, friendship with Hawthorne, he felt that he couldn't write, you know, pot boilers anymore. And you really get this sense of, um, you know, angst in letters that he's sending to Hawthorne at the time. Um, we don't have, by the way, we don't have any of the letters that Hawthorne wrote to Melville. I think oh. Hawthorne probably requested that they be that they be burnt or but we don't we don't have we just have it's like a one way <laughs> dialogue. Right. Interesting. So, yeah. so is 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 we, Hawthorne has that famous line about the damned mob of women scribblers. Yeah, mob so, of scribbling women, yeah. Yeah. So is that so Melville didn't want to feel like he was part of that. Is that part of why he turned away from White Jacket and Redburn? I think that that in part, yes. Um, and I think that what he Melville wrote this whole uh, two part article, actually, um, uh, it was anonymously published, but Hawthorne soon found out that it was Melville himself titled uh, Hawthorne and his Mosses, which was a review of uh, Hawthorne's second short story collection, Hoff, uh, uh, Mosses from an Old Manse. And he's going on about, you know, the power of blackness that's in Hawthorne, you know, readers think that they're, you know, he's this sort of sunny, it's really funny to us today reading it because you're like, who could mistake Hawthorne as this like, you know, sunny sentimental author, but that's how by and large he was represented at the time. And Melville says, no, he's much, he's much darker than that. And he's basically the American Shakespeare. So it kind of, you know, pushed Melville to go in that direction and become more, uh, more metaphysical. And so Moby Dick, um, he sort of like, you know, slaves over it. Uh, it's published. I think that, you know, we can over exaggerate the um, the degree to which it was a failure, but it was there's no doubt it was a commercial. It was a commercial failure. 
and was sort of um, it's it's really funny how now we think that this is not just the centerpiece of Melville's career, but also, you know, it's always in the top three, top five, you know, contenders for great American novel. Um, but really, it was like it, it was the beginning of Melville's strained relationship with his publishers and with his with his audience, really. And so the novel that he publishes after that, Pierre, is a, is an entire disaster. And um, he actually stops writing long fiction for a few years to focus more on on short stories. Um, I think probably because he thought that he couldn't even procure a publisher. So uh, Moby Dick, it's also kind of like um, sequentially or, you know, um, temporally, it's like the midpoint of of his of his writing right. uh, career, at least fiction, because he stops writing fiction after confidence man, right? with the confidence man in 1857 and then writes poetry for a number of years before, you know, we find this um, manuscript uh, of that was Billy Budd in his in his writing desk after after he died. That's posthumous, though, right? That's which is posthumously published. Yeah. Right. So, so that's yeah. 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 So so it's interesting. So I, I guess I never thought before about that connection between Marty and Moby Dick, but I, I, it's interesting that the, that in some way the failure of Marty kind of precipitates the critical, yeah, and popular failure of, of Moby Dick, and I, I think they are concerned with the same thing. But you said something to me a while ago. You said that he was reading Shakespeare for the first time as he was writing Moby Dick, yes. and so I would just say that I think I, I, I think Marty is interesting, but I would in, in no way is it to the level for me of Moby Dick, and I wonder if to what extent you think it's this the way in which the language, like he's importing yeah. the Shakespearean language into Moby Dick that is not there in the earlier books. Well, Marty is not a tragedy in the sense that, that, that Moby Dick is, or even like in, in the classic sense of a, of a tragedy. And so I think that one of the things that Melville got from sort of just voraciously going through Shakespeare, and you can see it in the, I mean, there's been all kinds of studies about this. You can see it in the language of, um, just Ahab himself, the character of Ahab himself, which is funny because he increasingly, it's not just in the novel as a whole, but over the course of the novel, his his language increasingly becomes more Elizabethan and more right. and more Shakespearean. But I think that there's a way in which the um the aesthetics of 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 tragedy and the the language and, and diction that he's you know absorbing from from Shakespeare really complements and deepens the 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 the, um, the philosophical and you know ontological epistemological questions right. that he's so clearly you know using not just Ishmael but also Ahab to um to wrestle with and so I I do think that there's there's something about the um there's something about the uh the I don't know breaking into iambic pentameter all of a sudden yeah, yeah. Yeah. That 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 gives it a, a greater like the aesthetic gives it a greater psychological and philosophical depth. Right. That's a great point. I think that's really true. Like the, you almost you really get blown away by the power of the language, almost like you're reading a Shakespeare play. And it does seem like even though it's written in prose, it could be I mean, you could scan it like it's iambic pentameter. I wonder. I, I, I want to sort of get into the philosophical way yeah. of the novel. Right. And I, I wonder for you, what do you make of. The long delay. It's almost like Ahab is like Harry Lyme in the third man. You know, he <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, not, yeah. He's like there, but he's not there. You never see him. He, he like the first shot of his is in, in a doorway in shadow. Um, I wonder what do you make of the first? I think it's a quarter of the novel. Yeah. Before they get on the ship, and and I wonder why do you think? Because it seems like so clear to me that Ahab's quest is what's central to what Melville yeah. wants to depict. Yeah. So why this why this like quarter length preamble with Ishmael, Queequeg, all the all the, you know, New Bedford, Nantucket, all that stuff. What do you what do you make of all that? I mean, I think that I mean, the the simplest I, I a sort of like very sort of, you know, naive, simplistic reading is is just that it builds suspense and, and anticipation. But I do think also that. Melville, Melville, especially in this period of his career, was an obsessive writer. And so I, I don't necessarily know if he had a clear schematic of where he was going with things. Like he introduces this character earlier in the novel 
named uh, is it Balkington, and he just almost entirely disappears, right. even right. though it seemed like he was building him up to become, um, uh, you know, a, a major character, a major figure. And I think that it's funny because the first hundred pages or so is almost entirely narrative, and then once it's only when Ahab is, uh, I mean, he's he's foreshadowed by a number of figures like. The, the you know the cracked prophet Elijah who greets you know Ishmael and Queequeg before they're uh, before you know when they're choosing the ship or when they've already chosen to to you know to ship aboard the Pequod, um, you know captains uh, Peleg and and Bildad talk about him right so there's this there's this mystique around him but then also when Ahab enters it's like that is the central point of the narrative but it's at the same point that the narrative also drops out a bit and you have all of these chapters that seem like they're asides and you know there's uh, you know, a, a whole mountain of scholarship as to whether or not <laughs> Ishmael is that we should treat those chapters uh, as written by Ishmael as right. the uh, you know narrator is he the author of the book we're reading Moby Dick um or this whole story or is it like Melville's just uh, you know asides um so and it's also interesting that uh, Melville, like later on in the novel, I think this is like three quarters or four uh, or um, four fifths of the way through it, um, decides to tell us something about, you know, what happened when Ahab first lost his leg, like as an afterthought, um, like Melville just realized this or so I don't know if if he necessarily it's a, it's a little sloppy in, 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 in places, yeah. but I think it adds to it. Um, just a question, Russ. Yeah, uh, is is so. Unlike so, what you're saying is unlike someone like Poe, who always meticulously planned out right. the end point before he yeah. started. Melville did not do that. No, but but it was not serialized, so it's it not, not like he was getting feedback. So it's almost it's funny because it reads kind of like a Dickens novel, where there are yeah. these things that like oh the public liked that, so I'm going to give you more of that, and but but it, but it, that's not the case, right? It's funny because actually, right? Like it was, it wasn't published uh, serially. The only, the only thing that was, the only part of it that saw the light of day before the uh, publication of the book was the uh, the chapter. It's one of the stories within the story. It's the the town hose story about oh. the um, the uh, the mutiny or the the failed mutiny aboard aboard another another whaling ship with a a captain that's you know monomaniacal or not quite like maybe not monomaniacal is authoritarian like like right. like Ahab is so that was the preview which is like it's it's very funny because Moby Dick just shows up at the tail end of it and he eats some, who does he eat anyway it's it's like that was that was the teaser for the for the book but it wasn't published serially and what's funny is that you know the chapters like uh, cetology or all the other chapters where the story drops out and it's just Ishmael slash Melville like obsessing over over the whale um, as this you know like physically metaphysically that those are always the chapters that that the students hate like students hate the right. most they're like right. can we just get can we get an abridged version where all these <laughs> all these chapters are 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 you know are, are gone so it's funny because you know you'd think that. Um, if he were responding to the public, the public would be like, get rid of all this other crap right. and focus on on the narrative. But and Melville knows that he's going in a direction that I think he's he's well aware if you again, those letters to Hawthorne that he's going in a direction that is going to lead to sort of commercial suicide. But right. he says he specifically says, you know, write the other way. I can't. Um, yeah, right. Right. I remember yeah. he says that. I, I wonder about that, though, like the. Those chapters, I think, are so great because oh yeah, I think theoretically they're really important. But I wanted to say I want to ask a detail on this, and which I was curious about because for him, I think the fact that the sperm whale is the largest whale right. is is philosophically theoretically important, but it's of course not. And I wonder, and the largest whale is not a predator. And I wonder, did did he did he just simply did that? No one knew about the existence of the blue whale, or was it, uh, did he leave it? Because it's totally out of the cytology even, right? There's no discussion. Of yeah. The oh, that's really interesting. You know, I have no idea. Okay. But he, to be honest, but he was, he was obsessed. Like when he, another thing that he wrote to, to, to Hawthorne was, um, and this, this doesn't answer your question, but just to show that like his, um, his fascination with, with 
scale and size, which I think yeah. is quintessential to the sublimity in of of the novel and the novel's wrestling with not just the sublimity of the novel itself, but it's wrestling with, you know, the sublime um, as an aesthetic philosophical category is that um, Melville. Oh, where was I going with this now? <laughs> oh, wait, what were we talking just about? Just the size, the size. Oh. Yeah, he wrote he he wrote to uh, to Hawthorne after he finished the book. You know, um, whales aren't the biggest uh, aren't the biggest animal. I've heard of krakens. <laughs> so, and then, like subsequently, uh, I mean, we're talking like you know centuries later. Um, Pierre uh, is there's an edition of of Pierre that was put up that's called the Kraken edition. <laughs> so, but that's a great question about about the blue. I have no idea. Yeah, because I don't you think he is invested in the size. And I wonder if that, yeah. that and this is where I think that we can turn to talk about it theoretically. And I wonder how that all that preamble fits in with this. For you, is it is it that Moby Dick has this status of dusting or the thing for Ahab? Right. Is that what's I know you've said that before. And I wonder if if that um, if you could talk a little bit about what that means and why that is and then. And then what is Melville trying to explore in Ahab's relationship to that? Because I think, yeah, you know, I think there are other examples of like Lacan's examples of a relation to dusting are are totally different. Right. They're like yeah. the collector who has the matchbox. And, and right. so it's not so destructive. Right. right. So that that's interesting. So I don't know if you want to just talk about like like dusting and and. Yeah, Ahab's relation and what's interesting for Melville about that. You know, it is funny. I think it's in I think it's in television, but it's not it's not Lacan. It's in it's in Miller's um, preamble. But in an offhand in an offhanded way, he just says something like he he gives Moby Dick as the example of uh, as his example of dusting. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find it and I'll and I'll, okay. and I'll send it to you. Yeah. Um, and he and then he goes on to say much like he says something like much like woman as 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 thing like Moby Dick is an example of that. But it's only Miller talking. It's not. It's Miller. It's not. It's as far as I've been able to to tell so far. Uh, Lacan either he didn't read any Melville, but he did, or he didn't talk about it. But I can't find anything in the seminars no, or any of the decree. So, um, so Das Ding. This is actually something that I'm still wrestling with for the book version of of my Moby Dick material because I think I, I think in the in the chapter that I talk about this in um, the subject lessons collection that I did with um, with Slavo Zizek that you're in um, uh, I think I say I think I say objet a or I call I call refer to Moby Dick as objet a instead of das ding and um, you know we could like bring in Rick Boothby to adjudicate this, but <laughs> so you do think it's objet, so you don't think it's dusting. That's interesting. I might be wrong. I mean, it could be. Yeah, it could be dust. I mean, there's there's a way in which I don't want to conflate the two. I think right. something. Th- I think dust. I mean, objet is kind of filling, holding the space for the thing. But but I'm kind of maybe I should be more careful there. But I think it's this. I think it's the same dynamic. Like kind of the same dynamic. Because I think that that objet is this right because in seminar seven lacan defines sublimation right as elevating you know an ordinary object to the position of the thing but but i think that 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 definition i would say that applies to objet as well it's it's also it's also sublimation um uh right because you're sublimating right right. right. so but anyway like so we could we could talk about about that whether or not uh dusting or or objet is 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 the correct term for that but what i'm interested in with the dynamic with um with ahab is that okay so clearly moby dick we were just talking about the size and 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 scale moby dick is sublime uh because he's you know his size his whiteness although it's funny because in the chapter the whiteness of the whale i think ishmael says something like he can't find anything sublime in in moby dick but but i think that's that's wrong that's wrong but um but isn't that doesn't that say more about ishmael than about it does right it does right right. because the 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 problem or here's here's where the where my theoretical interest is it's that it's not that nobody else 
you know, sees something sublime or something, you know, metaphysical in, in Moby Dick. Others do. But it's the way that Ahab's desire distorts his vision, his view of, of, of Moby Dick. And it's a, a sort of perfect, for me, instance of, of anamorphosis. So that because Moby Dick is the figure that has... Okay, now Ahab is probably like in his 40s already when when Moby Dick, you know, takes off his leg. But I can't I I can't um, not read that as a sort of Ahab's ushering into the the symbolic by way of by way of castration. Castration, right. And um, and as a result of that, Ahab can't help but sort of look awry at at Moby Dick. Um, he, he says, you know, I see in him in, inscrutable malice. He assigns to him this, uh, I think, intangible malignity is another term, almost like diabolical evil. Right. Uh, yeah. In a way. And he's able to convince, you know, the 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 unlettered crew, you know, more or less through various, um, you know, parlor tricks and you know rhetorical devices like that's money up. right i mean he puts the oh the, yeah right? the doubloon app uh, yeah absolutely right. whoever raises moby dick first gets gets this doubloon but he also has to go through this even though again they're not like he goes to this sort of like that quarter deck speech is a very philosophical speech i mean he's essentially drawing a lot he's saying you know i'm going to um transcend the line dividing right. phenomena from from noumena right. because he views himself as as uh, you know, a god, um, basically, uh, essentially, which is another tie-in with the tragic elements right. of it. This is Ahab's. This is Ahab's hubris, but he sees. Uh, he attributes something to Moby Dick that um, I would say is not in Moby Dick itself, but can only be a result of this of this distortion because of because of his desire. And Starbuck, the first mate of the Pequot, even says to him, "You know, I think it's." The second day of the chase is it the second yeah. day? But he says, you know, after Moby Dick swims away, he's like, "Can't you see, like, old man? It's not Moby Dick that is obsessed. It's your that's you're obsessed yeah. with him." Yeah. But but nobody else, you know. And he says at one point, this is earlier in the quarter deck scene. You know, Starbuck is the one person who he sees dissent in, or who somewhat voices his dissent. And he says to Ahab, you know, um. When Ahab is saying, you know, uh, vengeance is going to be mine and, you know, we're all hunting to to uh, to kill Moby Dick. And Starbucks says, you know, I came to uh, hunt for whales for the Nantucket market, not for whale oil for the Nantucket market, yeah. not my commander's vengeance. And he says, you know, Starbucks also says, you know, um, vengeance against a dumb brute that dumb you know, brute, sm- right. that smote right. thee only from blindest instinct right. and ahab is like it's not instinct it's this it's this inscrutable malice and he's like moby dick is the the pasteboard mask as he refers to him um he's basically symbolizes everything that you know he says like all that cracks the brain and maddens you know this great language right. and so another term i i would almost throw in there is master signifier in a way because Moby Dick also serves for Ahab as a quilting point of sorts. Like everything that, that he sees that is um, that upends things or leaves things um, leaves us, leaves us castrated or leaves us unable to attain knowledge. He, he anchors that on Moby Dick's, you know, hump. <laughs> I think right. Right. But, some point. But, but then I wonder if you would use this word, like, is he paranoid? Like, is he like, he, like it, it like the whole point, of the master signifier is it's a stupid signifier that's out there that everybody can see, right? That it's not hidden in this malignant agency that he gives it. Right. Mm, I wonder, you know, like I I think, I don't know about that, but I do think that your point about the contrast between Ahab and Starbuck is really important. And, but then I think that Starbucks appeal to the market is also really important, right? Like that, that, the opposition Melville lays out basically is between the capitalist and whatever Ahab is, right? <laughs> right. Like, right. Yeah. So, and I think in that opposition, he's more on the side of Ahab, even though you're right, like he looks awry, he's seeing his own distortion and he doesn't recognize that. But isn't there something more, I don't know, 
I, is, is it too pathetic to say noble about what Ahab is doing versus what Starbuck and the rest of the crew oh, are? Oh, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I think that that's what makes Ahab such an amazing figure, right? So there's a long history in studies of, of the novel that breaks it up into this dichotomy between Ishmael and Ahab. I mean, and let's face it, there, even though Ishmael is um, the narrator and is on the page a lot more than you know, his voice is with us a lot more than, than Ahab's is, Ahab comes to take over the novel. And then you also have, you know, others, uh, other critics who have sort of deconstructed that and said, no, actually Ishmael is com- is and Ahab are, you know, two sides of the same coin. But I do think that there's something, um, and this would be Melville's romanticism. I think there's something sort of um, Byronic about, about Ahab, you know, for, for the romantics, it wasn't like Satan in, <laughs> in paradise lost was the hero. Right. Uh, and I think that, that there is, Melville is extremely ambivalent uh, to um, to Ahab, but he doesn't just uh, he doesn't just dismiss him. I think that he um, there's something just like there's something in of Melville. There's a lot of Melville in Ishmael. I think there's a lot of Melville uh, in in Ahab. And he even though it ends in tragedy, I think Melville himself was the same sort of quester as right. um as, as Ahab was. I'm not saying that Melville was was mad, although his novels got crazy enough for, you know, contemporary critics to, I think the headline of one review of, uh, not Moby Dick, but the novel that he wrote after Pierre was Herman Melville crazy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and right. so I think there's so, I mean, Melville would identify with, with Ahab just as much, if not more, than he identifies with with Ishmael. Right. I think that's right. And and I, I guess I want to, can, can we like nail down what is right and what is a skew about his relationship to whatever we want to call it like dusting or object and maybe we can unpack that a little bit because you know which it is and whether, whether it matters which which the difference is like um but i mean i think the key thing is that it's it's has the sublime size right but at the, but yeah. it's also absent right like it's it's un like they don't they can't it's not just like a regular whale you get to see right every day right so i think that's important so the absence of it but what is so what's right about his relationship to that absence and then what's what's wrong about it i guess I, maybe that's too reductive but maybe that no under- well you know quickly before that i wanted to say that that kind of mirrors that kind of uh, moby dick's you know rare appearances now ahab's appearances aren't quite as rare right. but i mean ahab and moby dick in some ways are are the same object are the same right. object in a way. Right. And I think that in a way, like that's what's happening with, with, with Ahab is like, so you have two, you have two um, figures that are, you know, shrouded in mystery for a long time before they're introduced. You have the buildup before Ahab, and then you have the buildup before we finally see Moby Dick. Right. It's a and, long time. It's only the last three chapters of, of a book that has how many chapters? A hundred chapters. Right. Well, yeah, over a hundred. When they when they finally actually see him on the diegetic level of the narrative. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's only the last three, which is a, it, it's almost you almost would say, like, that's not a way to construct a story. Like, you know, no, no. Yeah. but it, it, I think it that's a great point about, I think, that parallel between Ahab and and Moby Dick. And it does suggest that the person who co- like it's like Antigone, right? Like she commits herself to a certain thing, yeah. and then she herself gains, like there's Lacan calls it the splendor of Antigone, right? Like she right. gains herself a splendor because of that relation. But the difference is she wants to bury her brother, and Moby Dick wants to destroy that figure of absence, right? That figure of sublimity. Yeah. And I wonder, I mean, I understand he's been wounded by it, but I wonder why Melville chooses or what it means to destroy versus to yeah versus what antigone does because i think you know whatever that is like honor or you know right. respect or whatever yeah well i i think to go to go back to your i think it's related to the, the your last question about what does what does ahab get right or, or get wrong about this relationship to you know moby dick and and, and nothingness is that i think that what ahab gets wrong and this is why I'm not sure I'm kind of like torn as 
about saying whether or not Ahab fits more of a, I think he's somewhat between Kant and, and, and Hegel, like his Ahab's philosophy, I guess, or Ahab's ontology. Yeah. Because in a way, I think he proves Kant right because he can't access he ultimately doesn't access the the the, the thing in itself he, the the noumenal he's he is a fanatic right as, as the term that 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 Kant would use for somebody who believes that they can access the super sensible um and so you would say well he's 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 an anti-kantian there because he thinks that he can actually tra- transgress it but actually he ends up re, you know reinforcing Kant's point but I think Hegel is important here because what Ahab, I think, doesn't realize is that or actually, you know what? I'm tempted to say that he does realize this, but the but much of the novel is a sort of fetishistic disavowal of it. He says at one point um, and it's in the quarter deck scene that we've been talking about, he says to Starbuck, I think it's in response to the, you know, vengeance on a dumb brute uh, um, uh, question. And he says, you know, um, basically. Uh, Moby Dick is, um, he says, you know, he tasks me, he keeps me. Sometimes I think there's not beyond, like nothing beyond the wall that is, because he refers to um, Moby Dick first as this pasteboard mask. Yeah. And he says, if you want to access, you know, the thing in itself, strike through the mask. Yeah. So that's his fanaticism. And then he says, Moby Dick is like a wall shoved near to me. Um, which I think is the same sort of thing as, as as the mask. And he says, sometimes I think there's not beyond that that wall. But he kind of recoils from that yeah. um, and tries to chase it. Um, so I think that what, what Ahab fails to realize is that that nothingness is inscribed, like Moby Dick is the sort of placeholder of that that lack, that nothingness. And he thinks that if he like, you know, stabs through it, that he's going to get um, a sort of some sort of positivization of that of that nothingness or that there is a sort of ideal behind it. And he is going to be able to grasp this this malignity in like in itself, yeah. um, as opposed to like the Hegelian reading, right, would be that. That that nothingness, that that gap is inherent to the phenomenal itself. Right. Right. And so that's what. What Ahab is, Ahab's already experiencing the in itself when he has this confrontation with the sublime that is Moby Dick. You don't need to go chasing after it in this sort of noumenal. Um, right. Now, that's a great, I love that point. I think it's so good. And I think you're right that he, I mean, the way you just put it is he, 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 he is wrongly a Kantian. Like he's, he, right. he doesn't make the move from Kant to Hegel. And I, I think that's, I think that's really good. And I think, I mean, like, it reminds me of that the Hegelian nine line of like love is seeing oneself in in what's absolutely other, and right. and and he can't do that right. Like he can't he can't see the wound that Moby Dick gives him as some a wound that he's himself made possible or created right. Like that seems to me a fundamental. Well, even though he does, it's like he goes further than these ca- these like banal yeah. capitalists like Starbuck and Stubb and Flask who are even worse than Starbuck, right? Um, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I mean, he goes farther than they do, but he ultimately comes up against this limit that he he wants it. He he can't confront the not like he can't see that the nothing is within him, right? Like and right. And, that, and that the absence is within him, and that causes him to lash out, and so he's missing. So, yeah, he's he's like missing the way in which he's already missing something. Yeah, and I think and I think Melville is aware of this because, you know, to go back to the earlier point about well, you could say you could make the same point about Moby Dick that he's he's you know de- his uh, entry into the novel is delayed and even though there's countless you know foreshadowings and anticipations you know in a number of those um, a number of the gams that um, that the Pequod has with um, you know the various other whaling ships or not even just whaling ships on the you know the days approaching Moby Dick they've seen Moby Dick and so you know that you're getting closer and closer but another uh instance or another sort of um instantiation of that of that connect you know that connectedness between Ahab and and Moby Dick where Moby Dick just sort of like redoubles the gap the nothingness in Ahab himself 
is that, you know, he he says he's constantly saying Moby Dick is this this inscrutable malice, this intangible malignity at the same time as he refers to himself as, you know, diabolic or, you know, I'm you know, I'm I'm, uh, you know, uh, uh, diabolism doubled or, or whatever he says. Yeah. Um, and when he, when the first, um, is it when one of the harpoons breaks, he forges this, he has this new lance for Moby Dick forged and he, he baptizes it not in the name of the father, but in the name of the devil. Right. right. And so it's right there in, in front of Ahab that, that he, it's essentially a, you know, a projection onto projection is sort of too simple, but, but what Moby, what, um, you know, this is to go back to Lacan's point, like this is why, um, and this is what also why I think like objet A is kind of, I like talking about objet A here as opposed to the thing, although maybe it does apply to, to Das Ding itself, but I mean, Ahab is literal. I mean, maybe not literally, but Ahab is seeing himself in, in, in Moby Dick. That's objet A, like that's, that's why Ahab is sort of, is, is, uh, is a quintessential figure of subjectivity in the Lacanian sense because his subjectivity is is estimate. It's it's out. It's simultaneously right. in inner and outer. And I think that you see this in other in other um, forms in the novel as well. A character like like Fadala, it doesn't make any sense. Um, well, I actually like this point. Like if I can go on a tangent here for just yeah, it's please. not that much of a tangent. But you know, at the beginning of the novel. When Ishmael and Queequeg are, I think it's when they're talking to, or just before, or just after they talk to that prophet no, Elijah, who tries to warn them about about uh, Ahab, they see some sort of like shadowy figures who might be boarding the ship, and so you could say, okay, like the straightforward, like naive literary interpretation is that, okay, that's this is just foreshadowing to let you know that there is actually like an empirical. <laughs> um, right reason for why all of a sudden when it's the first lowering for a whale this this sort of like phantom crew uh and phantom ship uh materializes that uh that ahab is is the captain of and fadala is the 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 harpooner of but it's almost as though fadala is born out of 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 ahab like that's the more interesting sort of theoretical reading of it that fadala is this sort of estimate piece of Ahab that is splintering off because it, it, it is a way of sort of Melville's way of sort of highlighting that um, Ahab's Ahab for however sort of kingly and imp, you know imperial he thinks he is is actually uh, this is Ahab's own word but he he's sort of all a leak like his subjectivity is like leaking all all over the, uh, the right. uh, and, all over the place and I think I love the point that it manifests itself in the whale itself too, right? Like that, the, and so all of Melville's descriptions of whales are really descriptions of of Ahab as well, right? Of the, completely, of, completely, yeah. and that's why that's why Fadala is referred to as as the the pilot. He is the one. He's connected to Moby Dick insofar as he is the one who literally steers Ahab and makes sure that Ahab is is stays on stays on this path. Well, well, I have a question about that. This is yeah. a, so from the from the sublime to the to the banal. Um, yeah. So two things: did the did the harpoonist steer the boat, or was there? Oh, okay, a- so um, no. Well, they did. They did. They did row. Uh, they did. They they, well, the harpoonist the didn't number- actually. The harpoonist didn't did, didn't row because they would they would sap their energy. Um, the other the other crew members would do it. So like Ishmael and Ishmael rose in. Right. So Queequeg is the is the harpooner for the the boat where in which um, Starbucks boat, Starbuck right? is the is the the mate of and and right. Ishmael is is rowing. So it would have been the, the other the other pilot, mate would pilot the boat, right? And then the, right. And, yeah, right, okay. So right. that's what I thought. But he's referred to but he's referred to as 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 Ahab's as pilot. pilot. Right, right, right. I know that. So here's my other question. Again, technical. Yeah, yeah. But I think maybe important. Was it typical for a captain to drop in the chase? I would no. imagine. Wasn't at all, right? No, okay. not yeah. at all. No, not at all. And he has, I mean, that boat is so, um, you know, it's funny. I, I really, I, I couldn't get all that far at all in the two most recent film versions. Um, one, I think, is from the late 90s. I think it was made for TV originally, but Patrick Stewart is, is a, he's and happy. he's he's great, but it's just so low budget that, 
And then there's a more recent one with William, I think William Hurt as a, uh, as oh. a, and I, I honestly couldn't make it past the first half hour. But the but John Houston is pretty good. The John Houston one is so good, but it's my favorite, but they write Fadala out entirely. Right. Um, cause I was just thinking about, you know, cause that boat that, that Ahab goes out on, um, like a, no captains rarely, if ever did that. Right. And B, if they were disabled, they, they wouldn't have done. <laughs> so the boat is like specifically outfitted so that his peg leg, there's a hole for his peg leg to sort of, you know, to balance himself. Right. Um, but no, that's Melville did that. Uh, he did that at other points of the novel too. Like when Ishmael and Queequeg, um, have what he calls the monkey rope. Yeah. When Queequeg is is on, I think it's the head of the whale, or the tr- and um, to balance drowns. him. Is that when he almost drowns in the when he almost drowns, and yeah. you know Ishmael has this whole point like this is true, this is true democracy because if he if he goes in, I go in under. Okay. That was not so. Melville writes it in that they're basically they're strapped to each other. Yeah, that's, that's an invention of Melville's. Oh really? Yeah yeah yeah. Interesting. Okay. Okay. So, so that's, that's really good. So the, so the, and ultimately I think, I guess, what do you make of the difference between the, the, the relation to nothingness, the relation to absence and malice or destructiveness, right? Like an evil, like you've talked, you've said it a few times, like evil, like the diabol, even, you know, what Kant didn't believe in diabolical. Right, right. Um, and but I, I I'm curious because I think like Melville it seems to be blending them together here, right? Like to be evil is to have a a, a relation to nothingness. Oh. Is that do you think that's necessarily true, or do you think like hmm. is the evil a kind of way of failing to properly relate to the nothing? That I guess that's oh, my, that's a great like, question. That's my question. Yeah. Yeah, boy. Um. I think it might, I think it might be more, it might be more the former. I'm not, I'm not sure there, there's a way that, I mean, this goes back to the earlier point about, about Ahab's status as, as, as a character. I think that there's something appealing to Melville and most romantics about the concept of evil. Right. And I do think it's absolutely related to, to, to nothingness. Um, And I think that, I think it's I think it might be the the first case that it's kind of just nothingness in itself because it's it's not as though I'm almost tempted to say it's not as though good and evil are both positive forces that Well that's what Augustine thought right like even Augustine yeah. thought evil was nothing but he of course meant it didn't exist really but but if you think of that in the other way like evil yeah. could be this way of relating to the nothing that good is a kind of retreat from Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that I think evil. Well, actually, so I'm going to tie this. I'm going to try to relate this to a point that that you've made elsewhere. So I think it's your book, Enjoying What We Don't Have, about which is about a politics of of the death drive. And I think that. Right. And you say you argue there that, you know, every pretty much every normative notion of, of the political has been based upon some idea of the good. Right. And I think that, in in a way, to tie this into um, to you know the question of of diabolical evil and and, and nothingness, I think that um, I almost read sort of like Melville's fascination with evil here. It's in Poe as well, um, Hawthorne. I, I almost think it's it's inextricable from from the question of drive. I think they really. I think Melville. I mean, that's not to say others haven't before, but I think. Melville is probably Melville and Poe are probably the two American authors who've like who came upon drive <laughs> death drive before before Freud did before Freud. and really sort of nailed it. And so I think that the nothingness is always re- it's related to drive in that. Right. Because drive wants nothing but to, to just repeat right. the nothingness so that it's drive satisfies itself just in the pure repetition, right? Of the relation to the nothing, right? Of the relation to nothing, right. which is why I think that in Melville's best work or most like sort of like philosophically, theoretically dense work, things like Moby Dick, Pierre, um, 
Bartleby, that sort of mid period Benito Serino Benito from like Serino, yeah. 1851 to 53, 54. I think like it's, I mean, I think that the confidence man is a, is a, is a fantastic novel. I mean, you know, weirder than all of them in some ways. Um, but this so drops not, out, doesn't it? This it just dro- drops. Yeah. But, yeah. but I think that, I think that that, that period Melville is sort of is fascinated with this dialectic of like nothingness or lack and surplus or surfeit, right? They're, they're always, they're always connected. This is what I'm trying to, I think this is going to be the sort of rubric that I'm, this is the rubric that I'm basing or framing my whole Melville book around is that (laughs) Melville is sort of obsessed with how a loss or a lack generates its own, its own surplus. So like, I mean, uh, Ahab as an excessive subject to take a, you know, a line from our friend of ours, Molly, Molly Rothenberg. Yeah. Ahab is an excessive, an excessive subject. Um, that only happens as a result of, of, of the castration of the law, the loss of, of the loss of his leg. Um, most of the people I would imagine, like the vast majority of the people who are watching or listening to this have not read Pierre, but Pierre becomes a subject um, through loss through losing his family name his estate and he sacrifices it for a cause much like um ahab does with trying to you know quest after moby dick and i think it's the same thing with with the narrator of the lawyer figure in in bartleby right so and actually i disagree i like how you make the narrator the hero of bartleby rather yeah i I was just gonna say i disagree with 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 slavoy's Reading. With everybody, right? <laughs> yeah, well, with everybody. I mean, but like, you know, Slavoj has a reading where, you know, he calls it a, he always uses the, or not always, but uses the term uh, Bartleby politics a lot. Like, right. I just don't think Bartleby is a figure of, of of the political. I think he's, and I want to be clear about this because in my own work, I'm much more interested in moving beyond um, the ethic, or l- l- let me put it this way. There I'm interested in politicizing the 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 ethical yeah. or returning yeah. to the political from the ethical, but I think that in in um in Bartleby, of course you can read it as an anti-capitalist story, right? But I think it's all about this this sort of like ethical r- relation. I think that the figure of subjectivity is not is not Bartleby. It's the figure. It's the lawyer who, because of the sort of nothingness in a way that he's getting from Bartleby, the I would prefer not to, like that that hystericizes in the Lacanian, like the psychoanalytic sense, that completely hystericizes the narrator. It's like being confronted with the, you know, the, the cave boy, what, what am I for an object? Right. And he's like, he's the figure of, of, of the subject, not, not Bartleby. And again, well, it's I like, you, isn't your it, best argument here that this is the one issue where Slavoj and Agamben are on the same side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Uh, okay. So, yeah. I'll tell, I'll tell him that. I'm sure he'll be, he'll be very, yeah, he'll, he'll love that. <laughs> he'll love that. Um, so I, I, I guess bringing up Pierre though makes, I want to, maybe we'll end with the, the turn to Pierre because I think it's okay. such a, you're right. I bet no one has read it. I hadn't read it till you told me to. And, and I just, it just blew me away. I mean, it's not as beautiful as Moby Dick as a yeah. novel, but and it's it, you're right, it's kind of messier, but it's still like philosophically. This is why I think maybe it's more interesting for this reason. Like uh, Pierre, no one would say except maybe Lacan, right, that Ahab is an ethical being, right, right. right. But Pierre is like, and I think yeah. most people who would read the novel would say, "Wow, Pierre, you said to me." Everybody else in the novel are a little moralists. Yeah. And Pierre is an ethical being. And I think that's absolutely yeah. true. I am absolutely true. Well, and I think, yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry. But, yeah. but here's my question. Like, what is it that enables Pierre to have, to be what for, I think we would agree is an ethical position. And he still has the same relation to nothing that Ahab does, yeah. but he doesn't have Ahab's maniacal destructiveness at all. In fact, he's he's really trying to like he kind of it's almost like a politics of ethics. Yeah. Like he, he really tries to enact it on the world. So I don't know what what do you think makes the difference between those two? Because I, I think there is a movement forward from Moby Dick to Pierre yeah. just in this just in this sense. I think I think the the 
I think Pierre become like his subjectivation or his entry into the symbolic is is different from from Ahab's. I think that you know there's a lot in Pierre about well, first of all, the whole reason that Pierre I get this is gonna let me try to exp- uh, I'll give a very like extremely brief. Uh, it, it's so complicated. Yeah, know. it's yeah. so because no one will no one will have read this. Yeah, Pierre's Pierre is. A, a young aristocrat. He's like 20, 19, 20 years old who lives with his, his mother in this, you know, bucolic estate, Saddle Meadows. And they and call each other brother and sister. They call each other. Brother. Yeah. It's really, there's a lot of really weird, like queering of like, I would call it like of, of like family dynamics, right? He calls right. his mother, sister. She calls him brother. Um, and his, but the father is, the father is dead. The father is, has died before the novel begins. And what, comes to light is that possibly this is why the subtitle of it i think one of the many reasons why the subtitle of pierre is or the ambiguities Ambiguities, it comes to his it comes to light that perhaps his father who he completely adores um and has basically a whole shrine to him um had this affair before he was married i think with with this you know poor french woman and that he has an illegitimate sister who is disinherited and so pierre this is why it's an ethical novel. It's a question of ethics. Pierre wants to, um, again, without fully knowing whether or not this is true, this woman Isabel is his is his half sister. Pierre wants to recognize her, and as a result of that, um, he he goes about doing it in the craziest way possible. He tells his mother, that without no one else knows that this whole story that Pierre may or that Isabel may be his sister. He just tells everyone that Isabel that he's married Isabel. Who no one has seen before, right? So he just shows up and says, "Well, she's my wife." And now. he has to dump his fiance. He has to dump his fiance, right? Who almost dies as a result of it. Right? And so, as a result of that, his mother, like, who he's not disowns. explained this to, like, disowns him, and he has to go. And the whole second half of the novel is him with Isabel, like, going into, you know, leaving the, uh, you know, the rural, beautiful rural setting for urban strife. Right. Um, and, but I think that the it's the sort of the name of the father like because the reason why um pierre does this whole rigmarole like i can't i can't tell the people the reason that that she's you know the, my sister because it will completely taint the legacy of my father so that's why he goes through this whole you know deception where doesn't tell anyone what's happened and just says well isabel i met her and she's and she's my She's my wife, right? And right. so I think that like law, the law is involved in a way that it's not with I see. With, with with Ahab. So, that would be so, my sort of like preliminary answer. I see. So so Pierre kind of cheats because he's kind of an obsessive, like his his ethic. Whereas Ahab is this absolute figure of defiance yeah. of any kind of figure of authority. Pierre ultimately wants to 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 cover for the father's lack right like that's what he's that's yeah. why he, that's what he does totally. so, so totally. it's finally an obsessional and he does and he does cheat he cheats in other ways as well like i think that he it's interesting to think about about lacan's you know the maxim you know don't give ground relative to your desire because in one way you could say okay well that's what the novel pierre is is all about not doing this but he cheats in many ways along the way like because his whole thing is that he's going to be the apostle of of truth with a capital t this is used to and he's lying the you know the whole time in order to well sometimes you need a noble lie right in order for he doesn't say this but but also with the relation to isabel um which is again if you haven't read <laughs> read the novel uh, those of you who are you know listening or watching but it's clear that in some way, he wants to use the you know the 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 fact. It's not a fact at all, though. He but he wants to make Isabel his sister as a way of sort of disavowing or disowning the fact that he's attracted to her, that he that he loves right. her in a way. Right. So there's and and this kind of gets to a, a broader point about why I think Lacan is interested, or what I'm doing with Lacan as well as as Kant and and Hegel in the broader scheme of my reading of Melville is that. It's almost almost more interesting to me than the way in which um, Melville's characters can exemplify certain Lacanian, you know, um, concepts or principles is the way that it like 
they get so close, but they fail to do it <laughs> or it doesn't line up, you know, exactly. And so I'm kind of reading it, reading Melville, not as though he's, you know, just exemplifying these Lacan, but like he anticipates and also diverges from where Lacan would have went with it. And I'm interested in those, like theoretically those, the ways in which I'm just as much interested in the way in which like Lacan with Melville sort of fails as, right. as it succeeds. Yeah, that's a great, I think. I mean, what's, what's fascinating to me is the way in which psychoanalysis almost never talks about evil. Right. Yeah. And, and Melville is obsessed with it. And, and so, and Hegel never, Kant of course does, but Hegel doesn't really. He Hegel doesn't, just, right. you know, like Hegel basically says evil is just this nothing on the way to being good, right? Like he just right. doesn't, he just doesn't think it has any substance at all. So I think what what's interesting about Melville to me, and, and you really disabused me of my notion of a progression from Moby Dick to Pierre, because I kind of, but I think you're right. Ultimately, Pierre fails in all these ways because of the father and his, and so his respect for the father. So it makes me think that there is, I think you're right to say that there's something necessarily evil about that taking up the relation to nothing or to negativity. Yeah. Right? right. But I do think, but I do think that, that it's, it's clearly in the same, it's in the same ballpark or same sort of realm as, as Moby Dick, because, um, you know, Pierre, I mean, if you think of, well, let's think about it at the level of, of narration, right? Like we were talking earlier about how Melville may have viewed Ahab. And I think that Melville was, was also, <laughs> there is something ethical about, about what Pierre, what Pierre is doing or, or, or trying to do. And I think that Melville is very much attracted to this. I think it's, you know, Alenka Zupantich has that wonderful turn of phrase ethics of the real. I think it is an ethics of the real. Right. That right. novel. In both novels, yeah. there was this in, total abandon of my symbolic status and my and yeah. my relation to capital, right? Like they like completely. Pierre gives up all of his capital. Completely. It's clear Ahab doesn't care at all. He's just no. using capital to advance his own thing. Right. But the but the 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 sort of the ways in which Pierre like Pierre's cheating is more I don't know if it's more noticeable, but Melville is more ambivalent about or writes that ambivalence into the novel more because it's we have a different narrator. Like Moby Dick is first person because it's Ish, it's Ishmael who's the narrator. But in Pierre, it's this um, it's a third person narrator who may or may not be omniscient, but whose whose relation to Pierre as the hero of the novel changes. Sometimes he seems to be within, you know, in Pierre's corner and almost you know, just Pierre's consciousness in a way, like on the page. Other times he has this ironic, even caustic sort of distance from, from Pierre, like where you're quite clearly supposed to see what Pierre is doing as a form of like idiocy. <laughs> right, right, but I right. still think that even, even in that Melville can't help but be fascinated with somebody who like himself in his writing of the novel is essentially falling on his own sword. Right, right. I mean, that isn't that what's so so fascinating, right? That 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 Melville is writing about characters who basically are doing what he's doing in the act of writing about them. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. and like, he writes that into Pierre in a way toward the end of it. It's it's remarkable. Right, right. Even because Pierre is himself is like he's Pierre's, writing his own poetic project into what Pierre is doing. Yeah, which Does, which so Pierre self destructs. Yeah, in his writing. He could write this popular thing. He refuses. Right. And then Melville does the same thing. And that and and by writing it, he enacts it. It's just it's really it's it's like a total mise en avis, but it's just beautiful. completely, completely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. just like just like Melville, um, who wrote these you know popular work, you right. know, we learn speaking about like, you know, when Ahab enters, you know, Ahab enters the novel late, we we don't learn until like. I think past the midway point of, of Pierre that, oh, by the way, Pierre was a, a, a was a, a successful, like a commercially successful um, sentimental oh, poet in his, right. in his youth. Right. 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 Um, you, yeah. you tell, tell the story. Cause it's kind of cool that uh, that was so such a deus ex machina that yeah. an editor came along and said, I'm yeah. going to take an edition that doesn't have that in it. <laughs> this is, this is, so I mentioned this earlier, this is the, the, the crack, the so-called Kraken. It's not so-called, it's actually called the Kraken edition of Pierre. Um, 
uh, Herschel Parker, who is, you know, like the Melville scholar, he has, you know, written, you know, like, I don't know how many pages it is, like 4,000 pages, like biography of two volume biography of Melville, countless other things on Melville. Yeah, he found that this sort of interpolation at the end, not the Althusserian interpolation, but the other, that like, all of a sudden, this this um, addition to the novel out of nowhere that, by the way, Pierre was a was a was a writer and he excised all of those chapters out of the text because he thought that it distracted or um, detracted from the sort of the concentrated, uh, you know, the, the intensity of the narrative proper. So in that edition, which it's out of print now, but if any, it's fantastic because it has all of these beautiful illustrations by Maurice Sendak. Oh wow! So that alone is is worth getting a copy of. But as far as like using it as the text to read, yeah. uh, I think it's ridiculous to jettison yeah. all those all those yeah, chapters. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because it really, I think that it really adds something. Like it'd be like taking the Cetology chapters out of exactly. Over yeah. There. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's the perfect point to end on. So uh, an addition yeah. not to read of Pierre. So. <laughs> all right. Beautiful talking with you, Russ. Thanks so much. Thanks. This was so much fun. Thanks so much. Cool.